So uh, good afternoon and welcome to It's All in Your Brain, Principles, Advances and Controversies of Functional Neurological Disorders. My name is Dorothy Burridge and I'm the Regional Education Coordinator with the Central East Stroke Network. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Central East Stroke Network within the next couple of days. We chose this topic um, as a response to some challenges that some of the clinicians were experiencing within our network, uh, and we thought this was an opportunity to share this information more broadly. So I would invite you uh, to put your questions in the chat throughout the presentation, uh, and we will certainly have time at the end for questions. So I would like to welcome and introduce Dr. Matthew Burke, who is a cognitive neurologist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. He is cross-appointed between psychiatry and neurology and holds positions as the director of Sunnybrook's Traumatic Brain Injury Program and the neuropsychiatry lead for the University of Toronto Neurology Residency Program. Prior to his current appointments, uh, Dr. Burke completed his medical school and neurology training at the University of Toronto and a fellowship in cognitive neurology and neuropsychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Burke's primary interests focus on complex disorders and phenomena at the interface between neurology and psychiatry. And his research on the present topic of functional neurological disorders has resulted in numerous peer-reviewed publications and media attention and outlets such as CNN and the Globe and Mail. So I would like to welcome Dr. Burke. Yeah. And again, I would just ask everyone, please to go on mute just as you are joining. Uh, and I will turn it over to you, Dr. Burke. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation and for the introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here talking about um, this topic to what I imagine is going to be a fairly um, wide ranging group. I imagine there's obviously a focus on stroke, but um, I, uh, I'd be interested to hear later on if there, I assume there's probably some different disciplines, um, uh, medical professionals, allied health, et cetera. So um, uh, I look forward to hopefully having enough time to have any specific questions from these, these fields, because we all take care of these patients. These patients are um, have slipped through the cracks historically in medicine, uh, continue to slip through the cracks, and really require you know our attention and understanding. Can I see the corner? Even of course. Technically... So I don't have any relevant of con conflict of interest for this talk. So um, as Dorothy mentioned, I am a neurologist, but my interests really fall in this gray zone between neurology and psychiatry, and um, you know. When we think about what falls in this zone, um, there are kind of infinite arrows, but functional neurological disorders probably epitomizes uh, this. And, you know, we we sometimes have really different views of psychiatric and neuro neurological disorders. And sometimes we forget that we're, you know, talking about the same organ and it would be really um, quite weird for, you know, a cardiologist to say, oh, you know what, I'm just not going to even try and understand or or take care of any patients with a, a problem of heart function. I, I don't only want to see the problems of heart structure and, you know, uh, that obviously um, doesn't happen. I agree the brain is much more complicated, but we always have to remember that we're, we're talking about the same organ. And so um, what bothers me about neuropsychiatry is that this pathway um, on the screen here, for example, a patient who suffers a stroke of their frontal lobe and develops depression or the thalamus and develops pain, that kind of causal direction that spans the two disciplines is well appreciated. Um, there's not too much stigma. It's kind of understood as a possibility. Um, and yet the alternate causal direction um, is extremely heavily stigmatized and to many um, clinicians doesn't exist. It's faking, it's malingering, where psychological factors or psychiatric disorders can change the same brain circuits and neurotransmitter systems and lead to neurological symptoms. And, um, and, and so this is a big problem where um, 
where the flip side of things still has so much more work to do um, to get into kind of um, uh, mainstream understanding. And that's what the focus of this talk will be on. And so just very briefly, this topic of functional neurological disorders at the, at the turn of the 1900s in, in Europe was kind of the pinnacle of academia. You have groups of neurologists and psychiatrists trying to figure out these cases. Unfortunately, um, for many uh, decades um, later, there was a kind of the dark ages where there was some interesting discussion around kind of post-war uh, neuroses and, and, and another shell shock phenomena, but really not too much headway. Um, and then over the past really 15 or 20 years with our better understanding of of uh, neuroscience and functional neuroimaging and seeing the dis disruptions in brain function that can happen with these disorders, it's really picked up. And, and that's important because as probably many of you are seeing, we are seeing spikes of these patients presenting to the emergent to hospital. So it's really important to have an understanding of these disorders. So really at the beginning, I'm gonna talk about epidemiology, terminology, then I'm gonna focus on some of the or clinical um, uh, features and pathogenesis, and then obviously try and leave you with uh, a good approach to managing these patients in your practice. So um, let's just take kind of a, a, a standard example that I'm sure many of, of you have seen probably multiple times over the years. So uh, this is a, a hypothetical case of a 43-year-old female presenting with left-sided weakness. Um, really no major um, medical history and no medications. Um, you're revving up, you know, to, to give uh, throm thrombolysis and, you know, you start noticing that some of the weakness is, is fluctuating based on the patient's attention. Um, on your exam, you're noticing, you know, things like uh, a drift without pronation, um, a positive platysma sign, which we'll talk about uh, uh, later, um, it has to do with the nature of the facial group and um, a positive Hoover sign and the neuroimaging is normal. Some of these patients, they might get TPA. Um, uh, some of these patients, um, as you're as you're rushing to, uh, you know, and, and they don't have any contraindications, but really, you know, it becomes clear as you're have time to gather more history that there have been some um, uh, kind of chronic stressors and, and more acutely um, prior to the presentation, um, the patient um, uh, kind of had a trivial fall on that, uh, on that, um, on that left side and, uh, and was in a bit of pain on that left side. Um, and uh, you notice further fluctuations of their symptoms and it becomes more clear that this is a functional neuro neurological disorder. And so what do you do with this patient? How do you understand it? How do you define it? Um, uh, this is really gonna be uh, what we're gonna talk about for the next little while. But one of the biggest issues with, with this field is even what term do you give to a patient like this um, who might have this hemiparesis with no structural um, uh, clear uh, cause for their symptoms or neurological cause for their symptoms. And we see a lot of different terms. We see splitters and we see lumpers generally in medicine. And um, the splitters take their own individual subspecialty within medicine so um, and give them their own name. Every medical discipline has a, a, a functional disorder. So for the, the GI specialist, you know, they have IBS and they have their own like Rome criteria for IBS. You know, there's fibromyalgia, there's, there's different pain syndromes. Um, in neurology, the subset is functional neurological disorder, conversion disorder, where neurological symptoms are the primary presentation. And you can see um, that um, the diagnostic criteria are fairly wide and, and broad, where really these are patients that have uh, symptoms unexplained by neurological disease and incompatible um, with neurological disease based on examination investigations. Um, it used to be in the DSM-4 that there had to be some temporal association with the psychological stressor, but it was clear from the data that often there isn't a psychological stressor or the precipitant, so that was removed. Um, a few other uh, tweaks uh, were made, but that was that was the big one. So you can see it's quite broad and you can see all these different kind of symptom subtype, weakness or paralysis being the main one you might see um, uh, as, a, as a stroke. And then, so 
that's kind of the, the splitting approach across all these medical disciplines. Psychiatrists usually use more lumper terms where they say, you know what, there is this common phenomena that we see across all these patients, you know, words like somatization or functional somatic syndrome, um, where patients have kind of recurrent multiple unexplained symptoms, usually in the context of psychological stressors. And in the DSM, um, they, there is a diagnosis of somatic symptom disorder, which really is any symptom that has kind of disproportionate anxiety, persistent thoughts, um, and energy spent towards the symptoms, preoccupation with the symptoms. Um, and I will say that I think there is some value to the lumping approach, because if you see that stroke patient um, uh, coming in with uh, functional uh, weakness, if you were to ask them questions about the broader systems and likely the, the core foundation of the brain circuits that are disrupted, you would probably get positive answers to many of these questions. Um, and so um, you can see that, and I see that all the time where patients are coming from different, with different primary complaints, but if you, they often have these um, comorbid uh, symptoms that usually tells us there might be a common foundation here. And so I wanna emphasize one absolutely fundamental point that the, however you term these patients, we're going to use the term functional neurologic disorder, but this is unconscious. This is involuntary. The patient is not trying um, to put on a show, to get some financial reward. This is something that's happening involuntary. It's different from malingering um, or factitious disorder that are conscious phenomena. And I absolutely agree there are certain cases, like cases where the lines might get blurred a bit. You can imagine a patient who has gone to five different emerges throughout your stroke system with um, uh, neurological symptoms and they get dismissed by the eMERGE docs as crazy and there's nothing wrong with you and go see a psychiatrist. But the patient doesn't really understand what the heck's going on and is really having these symptoms. So maybe by the time they see a specialist, they're going to want to make sure that specialist knows how much they're suffering. So there might be some blurred zones of some kind of exaggeration of symptoms at some level because of the medical trauma and the dismissal that they've had. So you can see how sometimes it can get a little bit murky, but these disorders are an unconscious phenomenon where they are not, where it is involuntary and they are not uh, consciously putting on these symptoms. And so, um, you know, how, how frequently do we see these patients? How, how common are they in medicine? You know, based on the fact that we don't get much medical education on them, you might think that there's you know, just a couple, but um, that's actually not the case. They're actually one of the most common disorders in all of medicine, and about 30% of the referrals to outpatient uh, general neurology would be a functional or unexplained cause of, of symptoms. Again, different terminology would change the numbers slightly. Um, and same with other subspecialties that have looked, like rheumatology. Now, the fundamental issue here is that these patients are coming in in high volume, but this is usually the physician and healthcare system attitude to the patients. It's, it's just, this isn't our problem. Let's just swipe this under the rug. Um, the problem is that rug right now is literally exploding and we don't have the infrastructure um, or, 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 or kind of knowledge base um, to appropriately manage these patients. And so um, I wrote a piece um, when I was down in Boston uh, during my fellowship because I was really frustrated by seeing um, many excellent clinicians um, really treat these patients quite poorly and, and, um, and not know what to do really in terms of management and kind of perpetuate um, uh, some of the things that I've talked about so far with the, the major gaps in the system. And I was really surprised uh, to see it, that it you know, got shared extremely widely and it was actually JAMA Neurology's most talked about article of that year and, and also made its way to mainstream media. And if you haven't seen this article, I'll just summarize that it has to do with these cycles of care, these maladaptive cycles of care. Um, and um, really, it's a small minority of patients that see a physician, get the appropriately delivered diagnosis, get a management plan set up, have access to appropriate multidisciplinary services. This is the, 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 the small minority of these patients in the healthcare system. Unfortunately, many patients will get misdiagnosed. I've seen patients who've had, you know, diagnoses of seronegative lupus and treated with immunotherapy unnecessarily for many years. It's really awful to see sometimes because those drugs have side effects. Um, 
but you know and I usually I try and make things interactive, but with the size of this group, I don't think it's going to be possible uh, to do so um, in terms of asking asking questions to the audience. Uh, um, uh, but most of these patients, um, they go through these second opinions and they get multiple tests, sometimes duplicate tests. I've seen patients who've had like five MRIs, seen by seven different neurologists. Um, and then ultimately, um, they'll probably get jaded with the system, many do, and they stumble upon either a fringe medical specialist, like an MD specialist, or an alternative medical specialist. And unfortunately, what happens, though some, some may be you know, well-intentioned, some may not be as well-intentioned, a physical quote-unquote diagnosis is provided for these patients, um, because that's what our society has told us you know, is preferable. Um, and so there is a whole host that are out there. Um, you know, um, the most common one, um, at least before the pandemic, would be chronic Lyme disease. Um, and of course, some patients who have, you know, confirmed Lyme disease might have rare neuropsychiatric uh, sequelae. But there's a whole host of patients that will get this diagnosis based on completely unsubstantiated tests, largely done in uh, the US and Europe. Um, and they get this diagnosis that, 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 account, that, that they're told would explain all their symptoms. They're put on thousand dollar cocktails of different antimicrobials. And maybe they get a little bit better at first because someone finally tells them what is going on. They get some placebo effect from the cocktails of treatments, but ultimately they will usually re-enter the healthcare system either with the occurrence of their um, primary symptom or a new functional somatic syndrome. That's when the patients you know, have a very thick chart. They're wedded to different diagnoses and it's kind of like the horse has left the barn and that interaction is often very challenging and um, it shows how critical it is to intervene five years before that and this and have them follow this green pathway um, and so um, why it's so important a the patients suffer um, the longer this, the, the duration of time to diagnosis, the worse the prognosis. Many neurologists uh, or, or other people in the clinical neurosciences here know the concept of neuroplasticity, where the longer a circuit, a functional change happens, that can actually lead to structural changes in, within the brain. So if a circuit is firing and firing and firing and firing at, at high degree, then you're actually going to get these micro hypertrophies because of the synaptic density is expanding and the dendrites are, are making new connections. And so so these symptoms are even much, much more entrenched. You can imagine, you know, intervening on a patient uh, that you might see as a, a the stroke with weakness in the first few months after the initial workup, giving them the diagnosis plan and everything, versus a patient that's done this medical merry-go-round, uh, going to see many different specialists all over the place, and then you're seeing them 10 years later in a wheelchair, all the deconditioning, all of the these kind of consolidation of, 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 of disrupted pathways. The patient physician relationships get eroded through these cycles. Um, patients feel like doctors are rushing them, that um, you know, the system really isn't set up for these types of assessments, which is very true. Doctors can feel very frustrated with these symptoms because again, they have might be on a tight timeline and they have patients that have numerous complex complaints. <clears throat> what to the healthcare system might be the biggest concern is the resource burden. So this was one large uh, study out of the uh, US which showed the incremental effect of somatization alone, even controlling for depression anxiety, uh, would be extrapolated at the national level in the US to $256 billion, billion a year. This is probably a, uh, an underestimate. You can imagine all of the extra eMERGE visits, specialist visits, uh, uh, resource usage um, that can happen. A recent study, GEM Neurology, corroborated this. We're getting, we just got some money to do the first study looking at this in, in Canada with the ICES data. Um, and I think it's going to be actually, um, to be honest, even worse than the US numbers um, because I practice in the US and I know that the private insurance companies put a, a stop on investigations and, and further tests. Um, so, uh, but here, um, uh, OHIP is really not controlling this at all. Um, and sometimes we can't even see when tests have been done. Uh, our, our, our kind of e-health uh, system is getting better, but it's still not there. So um, we'll see what this shows. Um, so moving on to pathophysiology, I'm going to go through this section relatively quickly um, because it's still a topic of ongoing research. And I want to I have lots of time to talk about some of the clinical um, uh, 
referrals and uh, and management factors. So we just want to highlight that you know it's been centuries really of trying to understand what's going on with these disorders. Um, this is uh, Charcot, a uh, famous French neurologist, that really early on said there's going to be a functional lesion when our and we'll see them when our microscopes are sufficiently powerful. And he had the right idea, but maybe the wrong tool. And it's really been the advent of neuroimaging, especially better functional neuroimaging and research that has helped us see um, the functional changes that can happen within these patients' brain. And at the time, this was uh, one of the largest studies, if not the largest study of conversion or functional neurological disorder. Um, and we saw these abnormal activations in parts of the brain involved in emotional processing, as well as um, the right temporal parietal junction, which is involved in uh, things like agency and free will. And so this disruption that somehow we still don't understand exactly um, lead, led to a suppression of the cortex that what should have been activated. In this case, we were stimulating um, uh, uh, kind of sensation in patients who had functional um, uh, uh, sensory loss. Um, but we can see these changes in the brain happening on a functional level, activity connections that are disrupted. And this is a more current model. And you can see it involves some really complicated areas of the brain that we, again, don't fully understand yet. So we don't even understand these areas of the brain when they're right. How are we supposed to know when they go wrong? Um, and so um, needless to say, there's been lots and lots more imaging. But unfortunately, or actually, I haven't fully read it. There was a study last month in brain um, looking towards kind of the holy grail of this field, which is being able to do functional imaging to, um, in a clinical sense, to, you know, be a positive diagnostic factor. We're not quite there yet, but it's getting closer than it ever has been. Um, but needless to say, there'll be many uh, barriers to, to doing that. So let's say you take my word for it that there is these functional changes that happen in these patients' brains. Well, how do they get there? Um, it's complicated. Um, but we don't have to look too far from different models and the standard medical model of a combination of genetic and environmental factors with a kind of a threshold model. In these patients, um, the strongest risk factor is environmental factors. And the environmental risk factor is adverse childhood experiences. And there's a biological mechanism for this, which I'll describe in a second. But suffice to say, across all of these functional um, disorders in medicine and pain disorders, we always see these strong correlations. And there was a nice study in Lancet Psychiatry that emphasized this with the functional neurologic disorders and also emphasized that it doesn't necessarily have to be what we sometimes easily screen for, like sexual or physical trauma. It can be things like neglect, bullying, um, parental styles, these things all can matter um, uh, when it comes to the, to, the, to the risk factor. And again, it makes biological sense, just as much biological sense as most things in neurology. So you can imagine that um, if during the period when the brain is developing, so from age you know, zero to 20, let's say, 25, um, if the patient's stress response system is put into hyperdrive. Their amygdala and that axis is put into hyperdrive for whatever reason, whether it's physical, psychological, whatever trauma they're experiencing. Well, then that amygdala stress response network, which is adaptive and, you, and supposed to respond to fear and, and, and threaten the environment, that is part of the brain is gonna make stronger connections to parts of the brain that it should, as well as additional connections to parts of the brain that it shouldn't. So instead of the amygdala just being connected to some of the frontal limbic regions, like it normally would, you get it connected to a few millimeters away, areas involved in motor planning, a few millimeters up, areas involved in pain processing, sensory things. And so later in life, when that amygdala stress response system goes off, not only would a patient maybe get anxious or sad, but they might not be able to move half of their body because of the way that their brain has been wired. And so there is a biological mechanism that explains at least this subset of patients. Um, and some really nice work by Martin Teicher down at Harvard um, has shown that there's actually critical windows where if the trauma occurs, they're more likely to have um, a different wiring and a different uh, type of uh, symptom predisposition. So it's really interesting stuff. Obviously, there's many patients who don't have adverse childhood experiences. Maybe they have stronger histories of, of other me mental health disorders or other factors we don't fully understand yet. And there is a growing amount of data that's showing some genetic risk factors for these disorders. Likely, there's going to be a combination and an interaction between genetic risk factors and environmental factors, epigenetics, um, 
is something that probably uh, is, is certainly at play here. I also just want to highlight that this circuit that is maybe one of the core drivers is not just connected to place in the brain. It's also one of the strongest connections to the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which drives neurohormonal and autonomic responses. So when you have patients that might have autonomic symptoms or, you know, pots are being thrown around there a lot, it can be due to these functional changes in the brain. Um, I'm not saying there aren't other causes, but this is something that happens um, and is because the brain is connected throughout the body. Um, and these are very strong pathways. And so we sometimes will see hormonal changes in patients um, with functional neurological disorders like elevated cortisol. It doesn't mean there's a problem with their adrenal function. And so um, what about um, precipitance of symptoms? This is, you know, everything is complex and not fully understood, but these, the precipitance factors is, is a really um, uh, something that we need to uncover a bit more. So there have been a few different studies on this. And basically, as I've alluded to, it's not commonly just the psychological stress. Of course, a severe psychological stressor can be a precipitant, but it's actually um, more... Um, commonly triggers that are not psychological per se, might seem innocuous, that trigger the brain's attention or introduce it to new symptoms. And um, this is again where I'd kind of ask what type of things might be here, but again, just with um, the, the number of people here, I don't, I don't think it's worth waiting uh, and, 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 and putting someone on the spot. So what are these things? Um, Injuries are very, very common, whether it be a very mild head injury, whether it be a physical trauma, innocuous physical trauma to a limb. Um, uh, I'll never forget this young girl that I saw in Sick Kids Emerge uh, way back when, um, who had had this basically, uh, had very strong risk factors for developing a functional disorder, as we just talked about, the adversity, and kind of had a fall on, on um, her outstretched limb at recess and developed severe um, functional jerks of that limb. Um, and it's like that innocuous injury was enough to provide new inputs to the brain, attention to that limb, and with the predisposed circuitry, she had a functional disorder in that limb. Um, and we also see infections as a huge trigger for uh, functional neurological disorders. Again, with this kind of um, amplification model, almost everybody when they get a flu or cold-like illness, they might for a brief period feel quite unwell, dizzy, headaches, um, fatigue. Well, in the brain of someone with the risk factor of the predisposition, those symptoms can get amplified, they can get chronified, they can start interacting and have counteractive response that is in the brain that can produce new symptoms. Um, and especially when these factors, medical procedures are another big one, have nocebo phenomena associated with them, which are negative, which we'll talk about our negative expectations of a bad outcome or symptom generation. That's when these things can be get really, really bad. And so um, nocebo effects are kind of um, the inverse of placebo effects to some extent. Um, and this phenomena which we're not really taught in medical school at all, even though it counts for probably, you know, 40% of, of, of all of medicine uh, in some degree, um, uh, has undisputable evidence. A lot of the stuff that I've presented so far, um, you know, neuroimaging studies that can be kind of correlational in nature, the power of nocebo effects has evidence that is literally the best studied in medicine because placebo is the most frequently studied thing in RCT because people are comparing against placebo. And what do we see in randomized clinical trials? If we actually looked, we see that um, when patients are given informed consent, when they're told of the potential side effects of the treatment, they don't know which arm they're going to be in, right? So they're told often of, oh, you might experience things like, you know, nausea, dizziness, headache, fatigue, et cetera. Patients um, that don't get the treatment, they get a sugar pill or IV saline, still report at a much, much higher level than would be expected these side effects or these symptoms based purely on the expectation of having these symptoms. Usually, sometimes the order of about 30%, 30% based on expectation. I mean, and again, this is like the most repeated intervention that's ever been done. And there's a nice New England Journal article that really focused on nocebo effects uh, that was done a few years ago. It stretches across all medicine. It's most prominent 
in the clinical neurosciences, psychiatry and neurology, but um, it, it goes across uh, the board. And this was another nice uh, little research letter in New England that showed that in patients discontinuing a statin medication, 90% <clears throat> of those side effects were nocebo effect when they did a careful, interesting, fascinating kind of crossover study. So you can see how pervasive and important this is because um, the vast majority of these patients are actually discontinuing medication based on nocebo effects rather than um, an actual adverse event. We can't look further than um, the COVID vaccines as a recent example of these strong nocebo effects. Um, so, and these are healthy, keen people. These were the first people to get the vaccine. These are like healthy university students. If you look in the placebo group, the ones that got saline, you see about these 30% numbers, fatigue, headache, just on the expectation that they might have these symptoms. Um, and this was kind of pooled and, and obviously made a lot of headlines. Um, and we'll talk more about um, these, the intersection with the COVID pandemic shortly. Okay, so we're doing pretty well for time here. And so I can really focus on some of the clinical management because I think that's really what Dorothy um, wanted to, um, to make sure uh, you were left with. <clears throat> so um, first, I just wanna highlight how wide a spectrum and how heterogeneous this patient group can be. And I really divide into three clusters. The first cluster is a pa the patient group who um, would be maybe considered the more conventional type or one that you, one would associate with this field where they might have these strong adverse childhood experiences, uh, comorbid anxiety and depression, a chronic history of quote unquote somatization where they'll have chronic pain syndromes and then maybe they'll develop you know functional dizziness and then maybe they'll go away and they'll develop functional XYZ symptoms and kind of this chronic Somatic symptom disorder, functional neurologic disorder patient. We certainly do sometimes see these patients, but they're just one type. The second major subpopulation is a very interesting and complicated group of people um, who um, would not say that they have any major psychological risk factors whatsoever. These are often extremely high functioning people, doctors, lawyers, CEOs, um, who have very hypervigilant brains. And it's probably been adaptive for them as they've gotten so far in their career. But this hypervigilance is adaptive only when it's externally focused into the tasks that they have at hand in their, in, their, in their work, et cetera. But sometimes there can be a trigger, again, one of these innocuous triggers, that basically flips all of those hypervigilant circuits inward, and they begin hyperprocessing all of these symptoms and sensations and inputs coming from their body. And this patient group can be extremely challenging because they especially feel any stigma about any psychological factor that might be at role, uh, might, 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 uh, might play a role, and um, can usually go down that, those bad cascades and uh, uh, tracks in the healthcare system that I described before. And then the third is cases just about like once per month that I might see where they're really kind of atypical, fascinating cases. And I won't go into, you know, further details, but, we, you know, these are just rare cases that um, help us maybe understand these, these disorders a bit better. And so um, when you're seeing a patient, um, whether it be in stroke clinic um, or more acutely, um, this nice recent review, this was just published this year in Lancet Neurology, which is our top neurological journal. Um, and it goes into a lot of the questions that you can be asking on history to better understand things, including you know, um, predisposing factors, precipitating factors, um, uh, relevant comorbidities, relevant uh, perpetuating factors, um, it really some nice figures and really some nice uh, um, uh, content here, including different new kind of variants of, of functional neurological disorder. There's also a really nice stroke specific review um, that was done a few years ago um, based on um, the fact that functional neurological disorder is one of the most common um, stroke mimics, um, secondary only to a few different pathologies. Um, so this is a really nice review article if you're interested. And so um, for, um, this is from that stroke review paper, when we were talking um, uh, at the beginning with our case, um, some of these functional um, uh, 
positive diagnostic signs rather than kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. Some things that we um, would see that would help positively diagnose these patients with functional weakness. Um, and you can see that a couple of the examples that I used, uh, Hoover sign, which I think we um, all uh, know about, and um, and 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 this is it's, it's critical though to understand that Hoover sign. So as you see here, your um, it's hard to to kind of um, explain it with a, a picture. I think I have a picture in the next in, in the next. Uh, and I think we can pull that up here. So basically, um, you'll see in the picture there. Let's just look at. Um, uh, uh, page, uh, sorry, uh, panel A uh, at the top there. So you'll see that um, we actually care about the right leg in that in that image, uh, like on the like not looking at it, but the actual patient's uh, right leg. Um, we would ask the patient to um, to extend their leg with all of their pressure, kind of dig that heel into the ground, um, extend their leg back. And you can see the examiner's hand under the hamstrings of that leg. Um, and then, and they assess the power just on that, on that um, alone, as you see in, in the first panel. And then they ask the patient to flex their other hip or their other leg. And what that invokes is an automatic movement to extend the actual weak side that you care about. And so if you see that involuntarily, the patient has increased strength when they're asked to do a different task, their attention is shifted and you're, you're getting at this involuntary movement, then that would be a positive sign in that second panel. Um, and the hip abductor sign is a very similar thing that has to do with getting that auto, auto, automatic moving back. When you abduct your hips, you typically um, abduct both at the same time. So you can, um, uh, you can basically feel to see if a week, it, when you do it again, before, the, the, before feeling the contralateral side, you ask them to abduct their hip um, and, um, and you see how weak it is. And then you get them to um, uh, abduct both hips, and then you can see this, uh, this, this automatic movement. Um, and so, um, Basically, um, the the core thing here is not that the patient these 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 tests aren't getting at the patient just isn't trying. They're they're getting at the fact that the involuntary movement is stronger than the voluntary movement, and it has to do with a variety of factors we don't fully understand. The attentional system is one of them, um, and certainly for other um, for other. Um, movement disorders, uh, functional movement disorders, um, we see how critical the, the brain's attentional networks are in these positive signs. Just one other thing, which I mentioned at the beginning, this positive platysma sign. So um, the facial droop in this case, which would be a functional kind of facial droop, is actually an activation. Um, and you can see this unilateral facial lip pulling, platysma contraction. You see uh, contraction of the platysma, and it's an activation of the muscle rather than obviously a loss of function that we would expect in a stroke. And so a broader look at some of these positive signs, including all the functional movement disorders, uh, was nicely done. Um, by a colleague of mine, David Perez in Boston, um, who uh, really goes into detail on the level of evidence for all of the kind of the positive signs. Would strongly recommend this article to those, again, in one of our top medical journals, BMJ, uh, just this year. Um, but it's really critical to also say that while we're trying to move towards a diagnosis of kind of inclusion um, based on positive signs you wouldn't see, um, right? For example, a patient who has a functional tremor and you um, get them to do a, a complex mental task like serial sevens and their tremor stops, you know, that type of distractibility wouldn't happen with other typical neurological uh, causes of tremor at the positive clinical sign, right? And um, the one other thing to emphasize is that, you know, instead of just writing in your back pocket or your in your letter, oh, you know, I saw this, these signs, um, and not telling the patient anybody uh, about it. You can actually, and, and, and I've done this before, where you can explain to a patient what you saw, and they'll usually say, wow, you know what, you're right, that tremor did stop when I was doing that task. 
Um, and you can leverage it for them to understand what's going on here, that this is a circuit-based problem. This is a functional circuit. I occupied your frontal lobes with another task that cut the circuit that was disrupted and the, and the, and the tremor went away. So it, it can be very valuable um, therapeutically to use these signs as well. But I did want to just say that um, we don't have positive signs for every symptom. And uh, needless to say, many symptoms, especially some of the overlapping symptoms, things like fatigue, pain, um, sensory symptoms, other weird uh, neurologic symptoms. We just don't have validated positive signs. So sometimes it is more still exclusion, even though um, the field is trying to move away to that. So when you see the patient, you uh, one through some of the history, some of the examination findings, in addition to obviously the standard neurological examination and history. Um, what do you tell the patient? What do you tell that patient who's on the gurney that you've decided not to give TPA to, who scans normal, who you're getting this additional history, like that first case we saw? What do you tell them? Do you just repatriate them to another hospital and say, good luck, uh, let's get psychiatry involved in this case? Do you tell the patient anything? I remember vividly, um, uh, when I was in my training, one of the top kind of stroke neurologists in the city, I would say, I was a bit watching them and they kind of, this patient was repatriated and said, they just, you know, kind of gave a quick explanation. Yeah, it's just stress. Um, and the patient's like, what? Um, and, and so, you know, how do you, how can you describe this patient? I appreciate, especially in the acute setting, you know, you can be extremely busy, you don't have much time, but how can you explain to patients in a way that they're actually going to, say, okay, this makes sense, rather than kind of, you're not taking them seriously or invalidating them. Um, so you explain that these symptoms are real. You are really having these symptoms. You're not faking these symptoms. I don't think you're faking these symptoms. You can liken it to a software problem rather than a hardware problem, right? The computer example is a great analogy. If my computer processor wasn't working, right? A software problem, no matter how many pictures I took of the computer, no matter how high resolution my DSLR camera was, I take a picture just like with our fancy MRIs, it'll look completely normal, but the computer is not functioning properly. Just like the brain cannot function properly due to a software problem that is real and physiologically based. You can, as I described, explain the clinical features on exam, talked about that already, tell them what they have as a functional neural disorder. They're actually quite common. You can explain the scientific mechanisms when, when uh, the history lends itself to it, like the relationship with the adverse events. Say, hey, this is good news that you don't have a stroke, you know, because these are potentially re completely reversible. Some patients, um, they don't, uh, you know, have a full resolution and it can be more chronic relapsing, but many patients can get fully better. And you talk to them about some of the relevant uh, perpetuating or, or contributing factors. You'd be confident about the diagnosis if they sense it. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, they're probably going to get that second opinion, and many, and then who knows what that second opinion person will say? Maybe lead them down a whole different chain. Um, provide them with resources. We'll um, go into, and then communicate the diagnosis to the other healthcare providers. Tell them what you mean by a functional disorder, because some physicians didn't haven't heard this talk and. Um, think that that means the patient's crazy or faking it or malingering um, and that it's all voluntary. Um, some clinicians in here, communities, 100% still think that. Now, if you don't have time, you can give them the calls notes and refer them to this resource, which is developed by um, John Stone, who's one of the leading neurologists in the field. It's updated. They have an app now, um, nice videos. Um, you can focus based on symptoms. It's really helpful. The FND Hope uh, kind of is more of a patient advocacy um, forum, um, also with some helpful information. And then beyond the education and counseling, which in itself can be very much quite therapeutic, because you can imagine if part of the problem are these um, hyper driving um, stress response circuits that are disrupted and the un medical uncertainty of what's going on is contributing to that. Well, if you give them an explanation that seems plausible to them and, and, and makes sense, well, obviously that's going to dampen down these circuits and can be quite therapeutic in its own right. But patients, especially patients with fixed weakness or persistent weakness, would strongly benefit from physical therapy. Physical therapy that leverages the principles like you just found on your exam with the Hoover sign, et cetera, of the attentional redirection 
Um, so they'll do interesting exercises um, where, um, and there's a whole list of different things where they'll, for example, get them to throw back and forth a ball, um, redirecting their attention and then get them to walk and you'll see a, a dramatic improvement in their, in their, in their gait. Um, some patients um, have more cognitive symptoms or uh, more challenges with getting back to activities with occupational therapy guidelines. Speech and language um, and swallowing disorders are also very common functional disorder presentation. And there's some new SLP guidelines. Um, so what I tell patients based on the presentation, I often put in the consult note uh, in the letter, um, uh, these, um, uh, these, these guidelines, because I know that there's few PTs, OTs, or SLPs in different parts of our province that have any idea how to, you know, these specialized techniques for functional neurologic disorder. Um, but I usually include them um, if I don't know the practitioner has any experience with this. With psychotherapy, CBT can be helpful. Um, I won't get into the details of, of, of these trials that have been done, but CBT uh, has shown um, good evidence uh, in a variety of studies. And this study is mostly based on their secondary outcomes. Um, but it, it's, it's similar to reconceptualizing their um, beliefs, any comorbid illness, anxiety, et cetera. If there are, um, you know, notable trauma and other related factors and other psychotherapy techniques like psychodynamic therapy, for example, this uh, growing technique is being used, um, it's really emotion focused and trauma focused with the overlap of functional and pain disorders. Um, Alan Abbas over on the East Coast has really been leading this in the world actually, um, and they have growing evidence. Um, there's huge gaps in many mental health services across our province. So if there's gonna be a big wait to see a psychologist or a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist and um, self-guided resources might be beneficial. Again, this is like a CBT based guidebook for patients. Um, this is a general one. Um, and there's also one for seizures specifically. Um, and, um, and I will just add that some patients might benefit from um, an antidepressant or uh, related medication, um, even if they're not having, you know, notable anxiety or depression, because the circuits are clearly shared. There's clearly an overlap in some of these brain circuits. Um, and so it's worth a shot, but it's not robustly evidence-based. I'm not going to talk about this. I have a whole other major interest um, about placebo effects. Um, I don't have time to get into this, but just know it's a very complex and controversial field because sometimes we see these patients might be suggestible, suggestible or respond to placebo, and there's actually a biological mechanism that would explain that too, but I'm not going to get into that. Obviously, the holy grail would be that functional signature to do in real time for a patient to, to see the areas of the brain that are uh, changing activity and, and connectivity and then intervene on those circuits that are disrupted with examples like non-invasive brain stimulation. But we're not there yet. All I will say in the last, because I want to leave about 10 minutes for questions, is that, and probably why I've been asked to give this talk, and um, I don't know if there has been a talk on this topic before, but we are seeing huge, huge increases in you know, referrals and, and, and talking to colleagues of, of functional disorders in the pandemic. As you can imagine, there are many, many factors. The general kind of mental health of the population is, is obviously poor, which is gonna be a, obviously a relevant factor, but also um, complex intersections with FND. We've seen a lot of cases of functional neurological disorder after COVID vaccine. Um, Again, that's a trigger that kind of has nocebo effects often um, as a kind of a medical treatment trigger um, that's been reported with other things. It's not necessarily specific to the, the, the COVID vaccine. We had a really nice podcast that went along with that article in CMAJ that I'd highly recommend with a patient that really explained what it's like to go through the system. We also have COVID as a trigger potentially in some patients. It's a really complex and controversial topic of long COVID. We wrote about this in, in Lance Infectious Disease, where there are probably different clusters of patients along the spectrum. Some a small subset might, you know, especially with more severe cases, might have this kind of post-infectious inflammatory um, uh, syndrome. But definitely uh, we're seeing patients uh, where the infection is a trigger, uh, just like for other functional neurological disorders. Obviously, this field's rapidly changing. Um, hopefully, you found this interesting, and I would love to answer any questions. I think Dorothy is going to facilitate the questions. I'll stop. Oh, yes, thank you. So, yes, we do have a few in the chat. 
Um, so thank you, Dr. Burke. So the first question is, um, what would be the process for patients to be referred to you? How does that yeah. work? Yeah, um, so um, basically, um, I am, I see patients, um, uh, but I have such high volumes of referrals um, because there's not too many people in the province that uh, the criteria are getting stricter and stricter. So the first thing is you need a clear, the patient needs to be clearly seen by neurology and clearly documented that they think they have a functional neurologic disorder. I, I make it clear that my kind of, I see these patients in, a, in the psychiatry department in the nurse psychiatry um, clinic um, where it's not a second opinion neurology consult, it's a focus consultation with education and management um, uh, planning. And it's usually a one-time assessment with a plan that's sent back to the local team. Um, and so that's kind of given the fact that I don't have any multidisciplinary infrastructure, unfortunately, um, at Sunnybrook yet. So it's just kind of a lone wolf model. That's kind of, and the, the, with the high volume referral, that's the current, currently, you can, you know, referrals can be faxed uh, to, to see me, but just know that limitate those limitations and those scope. And there are additional eligibility criteria that I can't run them all off. Um, but uh, certainly you can fax if you just kind of look Google up, uh, Google me and my Sunny Brook webpage, the fax number is there. Okay, thank you. So the next one is, what are your thoughts on the difference and similarities between FND and chronic pain, the pathophysiology, treatment, and long-term structural changes, and even some of the treatment strategies seem very similar. Uh, is chronic pain just a subset of FND? Your thoughts on that? Um, so this is a very, very important question. Uh, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, certainly those uh, like myself, actually, who would take a more lumping perspective uh, would say that yes, chronic pain, um, including chronic headache, including chronic migraine is a is a probably a subgroup, any chronic pain, the processes that are, as you mentioned, the circuits that are disrupted to move from that acute pain to the chronic pain state are like you know, in my mind, not differentiable from a the same processes that occur as a functional neurological disorder. It's just a different name. And hey, it would make perfect sense, right? We're talking about like a different pathway. What would make, how crazy would it be for um, us to consider functional sensory loss um, a, uh, a functional disorder, but then uh, chronic pain, which is like a different tract or a different you know, network with the, you know, spinal thalamic tract, a, a, a completely different thing when it goes wrong. So no, I, I, I agree. Um, it's controversial, but I, I would, I would agree with you that I think chronic pain would fall under the umbrella of functional disorders. And often they're very intimately interwoven with signals, pain signals, maybe sometimes being the precipitants. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next one is, would it make sense to term symptoms as of unknown etiology in cases for which there are no positive signs for F and D, there would still be strong rationale for referring multi-treatment as the best treatment option we have. Yeah, um, so I think we're seeing that, um, you know, uh, more and more, um, especially like another, so I, I, my main job is not actually seeing patients functional neuro disorder. As I mentioned by Dorothy at the beginning, I, I direct that traumatic brain injury program at Sunnybrook. And we see high volumes of patients with, for example, post-concussive symptoms that last months or years. Um, well, we don't, we, it's complicated. We, we only see really Sunnybrook patients for the most part, but we, these patients exist. Um, and, um, uh, you know, these are non-specific symptoms um, that don't have kind of positive diagnostic signs. Yeah, and um, we're also seeing that with long COVID, um, for example, where it is kind of an exclusionary unknown ideology. Um, and absolutely these patients, those are two, just two groups I highlight, but, you know, before the pandemic, I, you know, I was seeing all the, you know, you, you hear these patients as well. You, you you'd see them as well. And absolutely they need a multidisciplinary approach. Um, it's not something specific, um, to functional neurology disorders. You're not going to do any harm, uh, with many of the treatment approaches, um, but I do think it is important, you know, to highlight when there are positive signs and when there are not, um, uh, because, um, uh, because that will help, um, uh, you know, your confidence um, that this is a functional neural disorder. Sometimes it's, it's clear and there's not positive signs, but it's, it's, it's complicated. Hey. So we have a number of other questions. Uh, I'm going to kind of put these two together. So uh, is it always the younger population 
um, would you say that are affected by FND? And secondly, uh, what's the prognosis for recovery if a patient doesn't accept the diagnosis of FND? Good. Um, so there is um, the data that my colleague, um, uh, Sarah Liston, I think, uh, and others have shown is that there's, it's kind of, a, there are two spikes uh, and by kind of bimodal distribution. There's um, one spike in the teenage adolescent, early 20s years. And then there's another spike um, in the uh, 40s, 50s uh, years. Um, I also didn't mention this, but there's a huge um, uh, sex kind of uh, predominance in females. Um, again, this is complicated. We don't understand exactly why um, it, this is the distribution we see. We have some hypotheses um, and maybe some other factors that we don't fully understand that influence the brain, uh, and more hormonal factors. Um, uh, but uh, we typically see th those two groups. It, you know, uh, you should put the red flags up if you're if you're 80 year old or 90 year old patient, uh, for example. Um, you're diagnosing with an FND, though not unheard of, um, but yeah. Hey. Oh, there was another quick part of that question, wasn't there? Uh, yes, the prognosis for, oh, sorry, yes. prognosis for recovery. <clears throat> so it's really variable. Um, some of the, uh, oh, uh, and someone who doesn't accept it. That yes. is, that I can say is going to be a poor prognosis case, um, almost certainly, sometimes not. Um, but they will almost certainly go through years and years and years of uh, running around. And they might find another diagnosis that someone gives them when it's unsubstantiated, um, uh, uh, for example. Um, uh, but they likely will never address some of the core underlying factors that's driving their symptoms. And, and so that would be a, a big negative prognostic factor. But I, I can't put a number to it um, in terms of uh, um, kind of the prognosis. So I'm just going to pick a couple others that are kind of related to that as well. So um, someone else is saying, should these patients then not be given an unambiguous diagnosis in order for physiotherapy to help? Yeah, I'm not sure what exactly. Is. I, I think that physiotherapy has such a strong role, especially in this group where they might have ongoing weakness or, or movement disorders. Um, I gave a talk to the physiotherapist at Sunnybrook Hospital. They'd never gotten a talk on functional neurologic disorders before. I, I've been trying to um, give a talk more broadly to physiotherapists. Um, uh, I'd be happy to do so again, because I think they really have a critical role here. Um, and it goes against a lot of the other traditional kind of physiotherapy approaches, or not against, but uh, certainly there are different principles of the rehabilitation. Okay. Now, I know we are at one o'clock, and I do realize that some people are needing to step away. I don't know if you have the I capacity can for, for a, little a couple bit longer. Yeah, Okay. I can okay. Um, so, there are a few people just asking about the resources. So, I don't know if you would mind uh, afterwards, even if you just be connected in terms of some of the studies and articles, and I can mm -hmm. include that Absolutely. as part of the package to send out. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, lots of thank yous. Um, a few people commenting, some of the patients seen have not received a diagnosis and then get referred to physio. Um, and what is your recommend, sorry, what is your recommendation for allied health professionals who see these types of patients and do not have an FND diagnosis in terms of explaining, educating them about it? Do they need to have a definitive diagnosis from an MD? So I think especially when the symptoms don't lend themselves well to these evolving positive clinical signs, it can be really challenging. And um, some MDs don't like, A, they're not, they don't feel comfortable with these diagnoses. They're worried and rightfully worried sometimes with certain patients that, um, you know, that if they give them a diagnosis like this, so a patient will be really upset or really angry, even though it would be in their best intention. To, um, to go through with the treatment plan for this. So I, I appreciate that you, when oh you're seeing a patient God. in rehab, um, uh, and they, it, you kind of can read between the lines maybe on the on the letter, but it's not really definitively said and the patient might not be able to. Well, then unfortunately, you know, you got to do what you think is best in, in, in the best interest of the patient. Sometimes you could go back to the doctor, say, hey, and communicate with them. Hey, do you think this is what this is? Obviously it's good to have transparency with the patient as well. Um, but it, uh, that was a, one of the biggest 
questions I got when I gave a talk to the physiotherapist is, is, is what if we feel that this probably is a functional disorder, but that, you know, the doctor or the MD isn't giving that diagnosis, and that's obviously a very tricky situation. Are there cases where patients with FND are symptomatic and then periods where they become asymptomatic? Yes, absolutely. So again, um, if we're talking about a brain at risk and they're predispos predisposed to these disorders, they can wax and wane, especially if some of the factors driving uh, uh, those kind of circuit disruptions are not addressed properly. Sometimes patients definitely can uh, kind of relapse and remit a little bit um, in terms of their symptoms. Um, some can really do quite well, especially if caught early on, but definitely the leaders in the field would say that many patients can have um, kind of flares uh, with different triggers down the road. Okay. Um, I think we will stop there. There are just yep. a few other questions in terms of a little bit about referring to you, but I, I think you have spoken to that, and and I believe you did say that you do not have a a clinic with a multidisciplinary yeah, so team. Any, that, so yeah. it's not like a treatment pro. We don't have any no. embedded multi multidisciplinary services, unfortunately. So really, um, with just a high high volumes of referrals we get, we try to see the ones that it's like a core clear FND. Um, and we send back recommendations to the GP and the referring doctor. And I appreciate that's not a fulsome solution, but it's a Band-Aid solution that can get patients back on the right track. Uh, um, and we do spend a lot of time with the patients when we do see them. So that's great. Dr. Burke, thank you so much um, for, I think, a very informative talk. And uh, looks like it's uh, prompted lots of questions, which is great. That's always the intent. Uh, so I will uh, be posting the recording on the Central East Stroke Network website in the next couple of days, and um, I will work with Dr. Burke to to get just a list of some of the, the, the articles and resources, and we can certainly uh, include that as a package and share that with everybody. So again, thank you, Dr. Burke, and thank you to everyone who's taken the time to join uh, this session today, and uh, I'd like to wish you a great day. Take care. So thank Bye -bye. you very much. Take care.